Welcome back, everybody. So today we're going to talk a little bit about hormones. What are hormones? How do they work within the body? Um, things of that nature. So the first lecture will give you kind of a broad idea of what hormones are, and then we'll get more into the specifics of how they work as we go on. So up until this point, we've discussed how the nervous system communicates, but we haven't discussed about how the rest of the body communicates with the brain. Or at least we haven't talked about all that much. We've talked some about sensory, um, sensory neurons and motor neurons, but not a lot about how, for instance, um, organs communicate with the brain. So one of the primary mechanisms of communication throughout the body is using hormones. Hormones are just chemicals that are secreted usually by an endocrine gland, and they are conveyed through the bloodstream, and then they regulate organs and tissues. So, a couple glands you need to know. Endocrine glands are the ones that release hormones throughout the body. And then there are also exocrine glands. These are ducts that secrete fluids such as tears, sweat, things of that nature. So this is pretty easy to remember given, you know, some of the other um, topics we've discussed. Endocrine, endo means in, exo, um, exocrine, Etzo means out. So that's one way to easily be able to differentiate between those two types of glands. So now it's worth mentioning um, that we actually have two forms of chemical communication. There's synaptic and endocrine communication. Synaptic communication is what we talked about in the last several chapters, where neurotransmitters diffuse across the synapse and it affects the next cell. Endocrine communication is the topic for this chapter, and it differs in a couple key ways. One is that the chemicals differ. Um, for synaptic communication, of course, you have neurotransmitters, whereas for endocrine communication, you have hormones. Secondly, neurotransmitters are sent across the synapse, where its hormones are circulated throughout the whole body through the bloodstream, um, and they do this in order to selectively affect distant organs. Um, one way they're similar, and we'll discuss this a little further on, is they both require that you have a certain type of receptor. Uh, there are receptors for hormones, just like there are for neurotransmitters. And that's how hormones can affect certain structures and not others, is whatever organ or whatever tissue must have receptors for that hormone in order to be sensitive to it. So that's, that's one way that the system works that's similar um, to the synaptic communication system. So, castration is the removal of the gonads, which are usually the testes, which results in behavioral and um, physiological change. Um, it's been thought for a long time that um, the gonads were important for hormones and um, for our development. This actually goes all the way back to um, the 4th century BCE when Aristotle observed that castration in birds and units led to different behavioral and physiological outcomes. But this was more um, clearly shown in Bertholdt's experiment with roosters in the mid-1800s, and that's what's illustrated over here. So what Bertholdt found is that um, by removing the testes early in development, it led to both behavioral and physiological differences. However, if the rooster was castrated but one testicle was reimplanted, the rooster developed normally, even though the testicle's nerve was severed, that connection was severed. So through this experiment, the conclusion was that there must be something about um, the testes releasing some type of chemical messenger, um, some type of um, signal that's not tied to the nerve in order to have these changes in maturation. Because otherwise, if it's just that nerve, then when you reimplant that testy, not reconnecting the nerve, you should see no difference than if you didn't reconnect the testy. So, what you see here, we have the three groups. We have um, one that's just left normally, so they're your control roosters. Uh, you have one where the testes were removed and um, were not replaced. 
and then you had one where the testes uh, were removed, but one of them was reimplanted in the abdominal cavity immediately after removal. And what you see here is really no difference between those that were not um, not affected, where no testes were removed, and those that had the testy re-implanted. Um, but you see a significant difference both in behavior, um, so that would be being aggressive, you know, mounting hens, um, and also in the physical appearance between those who had the testes and those who don't. So hormones, we already know, are important for development. We'll get into that more later. But this is just one of the first experiments showing that it's not all through the nervous system. It's This isn't about the nerves connecting the testes. It's actually a chemical messenger that's being released by the testes that are leading to these changes. So this will be a very good illustration for you to review for the exam. You know, there's always one really good table or illustration to review. This is the one for this chapter because it gives you um, the different glands with their positions as well as some of the hormones that they release or are responsible for. Something to pay attention to, though, is that while these, act, while these glands are... Um, while the glands are spread throughout the body, many of the actions are actually controlled by the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is extremely important, as you'll see in a later lecture on this. So, know about the hypothalamus, and then just review for each gland what it is that it's responsible for. So just you know, take, take some time, really study this illustration. I think that's going to help you out quite a bit on the next quiz. So a couple of different definitions that will be helpful as we describe these systems. Uh, the first is autocrine communication. This is when um, a chemical that is released feeds back to the same cellular structure that released it. Think of this like a thermostat. A thermostat can turn on the heat can turn on the heat, but it also monitors the temperature in the house, and then it turns off the heat when the house gets back to an acceptable temperature. This is how the autocrine communication system works. It releases the chemical, but it also has its own autoreceptors, so it's also sensing for the levels of that chemical in the bloodstream. And once the level of the hormone gets to an adequate level, it shuts off. So that'll be something that we'll talk about a lot going forward. It's, and it's one of the interesting parts of this um, system. Like we'll t actually talk a little bit later about how oral contraceptions are contraceptive agents work. Um, it's actually using one of these systems, which I think is really interesting. There's also pheromone communication. Um, pheromones are chemical signals that are released outside one's body that are meant to affect members of the same species. So dogs um, urinating to mark their territory is a really good example of pheromone communication. Of course, there are also all the little cheesy things where they try to sell it for, you know, attracting a mate and things like that. Uh, very little research behind that. But um, the main thing you need to know is pheromones are chemical communications that um, are meant to be within one species. There are also allomones. So allomone communication is when a chemical released by one species is meant to affect the behavior of another species. Um, it's hard to think of a much better example of alimony communication than stunts. You know, stunts will spray a horribly smelling spray in order to get you to stay the heck away from them, and that works quite well. So that would be an alimony. It's a chemical release that is meant to affect the behavior of other species. Oops. There we go. So... The book lists um, six general principles of hormone actions. Overall, they're very straightforward, but they're just a couple I want to highlight. And I'm going to wait on this. I'm going to go a little slower on this slide because I know you need to copy these down. So first, hormones usually act in a gradual fashion, meaning that they are, um, their response often takes hours or days or even weeks. There are exceptions to this, such as adrenaline, but for many of them, this is the case.
Second, hormones are much less cause and effect um, as far as behavior than neurotransmitters are. What we mean by that is that hormones tend to alter behavior through changing the intensity or the probability rather than giving more dichotomous changes like neurotransmitters. So it's not it's not as yes or no um, for a behavior change. It's more difference in um, it's gradated, I guess you'd say. It's more, um, well, I guess gradated is about the best term I can think of. Um, so it's more in levels. It's not just yes or no, um, aggressive or not. It could be you know, a little more aggressive or a little less aggressive type thing. So, for instance, let Let's say I gave you enough of a benzodiazepine. You know, if I give you a lot of a benzodiazepine, it's going to make you calm down, or you're going to pass out or die, or you know, you're going to calm down. However, if I give you more testosterone, it will increase the frequencies and tendencies of behavior, such as aggressive behavior, but it's not a cause and effect. It's not going to cause you necessarily to be aggressive. It just increases the likelihood of it. Um, also, much like neurochemicals, uh, we find a relation between hormones and behavior. We find that this relation is reciprocal, meaning that they both affect each other. So, for example, if your sports team loses, your testosterone on average will decrease, whereas it won't if your sports team wins. So, our behavior also affects our horm hormone levels. It's not a one-way street. So, a um, couple more principles. The one I really wanted to highlight here is number nine. So, much like neurotransmitters, the only way, again, an organ or a cell is affected by a hormone is if they have a receptor for that hormone. This is how hormones can have fairly specific targets despite being circulated throughout the entire body. So, you know, if you're if you were wondering how can a hormone affect just one organ, that's why it's because the other organs don't have receptors for that hormone, so they're not affected by that hormone. Um, otherwise, you can see these are these principles are pretty straightforward. Um, we'll talk a lot more about number six when we get to sleep. Um, melatonin is a well-known hormone that's controlled by circadian and affects sleep, but also affects weight. We'll talk about that later. Um, so, in a lot of ways, what you'll see is that hormones are similar to neurotransmitters in a lot of ways. The main difference is that they're going to be circulating through the bloodstream instead of just staying in that synaptic cleft. Um, the place where the similarities between hormones and neurotransmitters is best exemplified is in the hypothalamus which you'll soon learn is responsible for managing a great number of these hormone systems in order to maintain homeostasis. So the neurosecretory um, cells are actually specialized neurons in the hypothalamus. They are like normal neurons in every way, except for they actually release hormones into the bloodstream instead of releasing neurotransmitters into the synapse. So this is one area where um, the hypothalamus is a little different because it can release hormones and it does release hormones. Um, there are also neuropeptides um, which can act as neuromodulators and what they do is they alter the sensitivity to a neurotransmitter. As we already alluded to, there are some differences between hormones and neural communication that are notable. First, the method of transportation is very different. Uh, neural communication is precise, like a phone call or an email. I call some someone's number and I get just that person, and they are the only one that gets the message. Hormonal communication is much like communication through radio or Facebook or Twitter. I put the information out there and it goes everywhere, including non-intended recipients. Um, and the people that actually get the message are just the ones that have that receptor. 
Second, neural messages, as we discussed, um, are very rapid, whereas hormonal messages are significantly slower usually. And third, hormones travel all throughout the body, and thus they have to travel much, much longer than a neurotransmitter, of course. Uh, a couple other differences. Um, because of how the action potential works, neural communication is digital, meaning ones and zeros. It's either going or it's not going. Either fires or it doesn't. Hormonal transmission is analog, meaning you get a range in strength. It isn't either present or absent. Um, it's present, but only to a certain degree. So that's a pretty big difference between hormonal communication and neural communication. Uh, lastly, hormones are almost always involuntarily controlled. So um, with it, while some neural communications obviously are under voluntary control, when you're you know, thinking about something or focusing on something, that's something that you're voluntarily controlling and changing aspects of your brain. You, you're not really able to do that with hormonal communication.